Hello, and welcome to the arbitration conversation. Um, as many of you know, it won't be long, and we'll be at episode 100. And in our final five, we have really a lot of heavy hitters here in arbitration. And today we're going to talk to Gary Benton. Gary Benton, he's an internationally recognized arbitrator and mediator throughout the world with over 30 years of experience. And what's cool is he's also heading up the Silicon Valley Arbitration and Mediation Center. And really, he's in the heart of things when it comes to technology, right? Like you couldn't ask for anything better. So today we're going to talk about technology and arbitration with none other than Gary Benton. So Gary, thank you. Oh, Amy, thank you so much. I just love your enthusiasm. It's just fantastic and really great to be here. So thank you for including me in the final five. That's wonderful. The final five. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, could you give a little bit of background about how it came to be, how you decided to get involved with um, the Silicon Valley Arbitration and Mediation Center and the evolution of sure. that center? Sure, sure. So um, I... Um, I'm a Silicon Valley lawyer at, at heart. Um, I've been practicing um, here in Palo Alto, California for um, over 30 years. Um, but my career has really been with a number of very large international firms that um, have focused on um, arbitration, and particularly international arbitration. So Kader Brothers way back when and, and the Pillsbury firm um, after that. And um, as I saw all of my colleagues who were doing these you know, billion dollar project finance and energy deals and arbitration, um, I felt a little bit left out. And then I thought to myself, well, wait, don't feel left out, get to be part of it. And so um, I, I started looking into opportunities to bring together my passion for technology, um, sector work um, to the arbitration field. And um, found out that there really were a lot of opportunities. And that led to my founding, um, the Silicon Valley Arbitration and Mediation Center, I don't know, about six plus years ago. Um, and I'd say it's really been a, a great success. We've had some fantastic leadership um, following me. I'm still the chairman of the board and work very actively with the group. Um, but the concept really was to have a nonprofit educational foundation, not administering cases, but really to get out into the industry sector and educate corporations, educate uh, practitioners, just to let them know about the benefits of uh, US and international uh, arbitration and mediation. And, and it's really um, grown quite nicely from there. That's really cool. And I have to say, I know that you've been an adjunct professor with Pepperdine and Santa Clara. So it seems as though you do have a heart for education and, and introducing people to new ideas. So as this new group and as the founder, what are some of the ways that you've been able to do that? What are some of the things that you do in terms of your activities? So it has mostly been putting on educational programs. And of course, here we are now in the, the hopefully closer to the end of the pandemic and we'll have fewer and fewer webinars and more and more live programming. But uh, we've done um, over the years, many presentations, um, both to large groups and then also one-on-ones with um, corporations, with law firms, um, really just talking about particular interests that they have. And, you know, it's been, been interesting, uh, you know, I, 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 in Silicon Valley, there, there's just so much technology, it's what everybody does. Um, and yet, historically, um, companies here have been very comfortable with going to court. Um, mm -hmm. And that has really changed um, uh, a lot in the last 15 plus years because of the growth of so many other technology companies and sectors around the world. And so um, uh, there needs to be a little bit more room for um, EDR so that people don't get hauled into a foreign court and have to deal with that and are comfortable finding a neutral forum. And so tech companies yeah. have started to figure that out. Um, you know, companies um, in here in Silicon Valley um, don't necessarily want to be in a PRC court, for example. Mm -hmm. And likewise, you know, companies throughout Asia um, are not particularly happy about facing U.S. court system with our discovery and, and um, uh, the uncertainty of having juries. And so um, I think for tech companies, they're really looking for some specialized expertise and they get that so readily with, with arbitration and mediation. Yeah, that was the big piece that I was thinking about is just the fact that to have a decision maker who 
or a facilitator who understands the issues, who really gets it, right? Yeah. And, and that can be hard if you're talking about a generalist judge who who's never even dealt with, can barely, you know, get online <laughs> to send an email. Oh, oh, right. That's probably and, going to be a problem. That, that's exactly right. right. And there, are, there are many, you know, very good judges around the U.S. and, and many who do know um, uh, uh, how to use a computer. But um, that's just not the same as having someone who's really served in the industry, who, who has you know, the educational background or the, the work background. And um, I think it makes a difference. It's not, and the idea isn't necessarily to replace experts because you know, experts really are that, they're experts. But at least, you know, in, take for example, a simple technology dispute to have um, a, a, an arbitrator who understands the difference between source code and object code, you know, something very basic in the tech field um, is a big advantage over um, many decision makers, particularly um, in, when you get outside the US. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And especially, I don't know what you've seen in your own practice, but what about smart contract disputes? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's really so amazing when, um, when I, put together the Silicon Valley Center. Um, and even before that, you know, if you just go back 10 years, um, there wasn't a, a discussion about um, arbitration and technology. You never heard those two words in the same sentence. And, you know, back then when you did technology disputes, it was, you know, you'd have a licensing you know, dispute, there'd be some technology involved. And now with, um, you know, with, of course, the internet, um, it's just ballooned into so many amazing areas. So, um, uh, blockchain and, and, and cryptocurrency, of course, you know, is, is taking up a lot of space. But beyond um, cryptocurrency, I mean, the, the advent of, of, of smart uh, contracts is really interesting, really unique. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the idea that you can have this whole, as, as you know, you're, you've been one of the expert writers in this field, this whole self-contained um, you know, uh, uh, online code to, to resolve an agreement is just pretty amazing. And I know we're just at the very start of, of seeing how that all develops. Yeah, no, it's exciting that you're like right there in Silicon Valley, what you're seeing. And I would imagine that just thinking about should there be different rules in place when you're talking about those kinds of disputes or what mm -hmm. might you think, are there new things on the horizon that maybe we have not even heard about yet that'll come out in terms of like standards perhaps or something when we're talking about arbitration of these technology disputes, yeah. especially considering data and the type of data involved and privacy. I don't know, maybe there are new developments. There, Well, I mean, there are, you know, th this is the whole beauty of the field, right? You know, yeah. like constantly, constantly evolving. I, I, I kind of wonder how you could be in some other you know, industry sector, just like well, it's the same thing sort of over and over again. With right. technology, it's just like there's something new every single day and different ways to deal with it. And so, you know, um, you know, the, the ways to approach technology. I mean, there, there's been um, a consideration of a new rule set at the United Nations and UNSTRAL. Mm -hmm. there, there's um, mm -hmm. uh, every single private company that is looking at um, smart contracts is, is trying to come up with their own way mm -hmm. of of doing dispute resolution. Some of them, I have to say, are pretty scary. Um, you know, know. The is that, that people don't have any legal training um, and, and they're gonna go in and, and somehow the, the company that's issuing the, the, the coin is gonna be able to be fair. It's, so there's a lot of room for growth. There's a lot of room for the, you know, the, the leading arbitral institutions to, to play a bigger role in it. Um, I, it, and it amazes me, and I have to say in the past year, you know, I spend now most of my time dealing with disputes over um, cryptocurrency issuances. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with of, of course cybersecurity disputes has become mm -hmm. big with, with mm -hmm. the advent of ransomware, mm -hmm. and and more and more, you know, we're we're seeing other um, um, uh, ties to to blockchain and smart contracts are going to be, I think, you know, one of the next big big forefronts there for sure. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And even the questions about cryptocurrency, that's really smart contracts. And when you think about sort of cybersecurity, goodness gracious, I mean, that is huge in the industry, I would imagine. And then who better but to have an arbitrator that's actually, you know, knows about these things and has that expertise. I do think that can be tremendously powerful. Um, for the future and how do you 
protect the future of these different industries. So I'm sure that yeah. comes up a lot. Um, it, it, so it really what does. sorts of, yeah, what do you predict? Okay, so if I might say, all right, Gary, yeah. get the crystal ball out, get the crystal ball out. What do you think things will look like for arbitration and specifically for technology disputes like five years, 10 years from now? What do you think will be the wow. biggest trends? So, I mean, if, if we're looking at where things are going right now, I think you've already hit on, on the big two, which is blockchain and everything that derives from it, you know, cryptocurrency, financing, DeFi financing related to it, um, you know, the whole sort of issue relating to ICOs um, and, and, and smart contracts. I think that's, that's pretty important. Um, biotechnology, I mean, when I, when I think about technology, I, I don't just consider high technology or IT as we call it, but I think about um, life sciences, pharma, you know, biotech. I think about mm -hmm. telecommunications. I think about um, you know, even alternative energy in some way. And, and in, mm -hmm. in that regard, biotech, I mean, is really um, moving forward at, at a pretty incredible pace. Um, and, and certainly we can understand why given, you know, again, the you know, concerns about the pandemic, but um, a, a lot of opportunities for genetic engineering and disputes there. Um, of course, we all talk about artificial intelligence. Um, and, and I know so many arbitrators are worried that it's going to take over their lives. But um, I, I think we have a long way to go <laughs> before we need to worry too much about I agree. it. Uh, <laughs> but it's making some you know, really yeah. important inroads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I think the potential there, of course, that's, it, it's beyond our comprehension because that's exactly mm -hmm. what artificial intelligence is all about. It's, it's about uh, decision making by uh, technology that you know we're not capable of doing ourselves. Right. So, um, I think that um, not next year, not the year after, but you know, five to ten years from now, I think we'll be seeing much more in in the real field of artificial in intelligence, not just companies that say they do it and they really don't, but but right. really being put to use um, in making decision making that that we can't, and then. Now, this is going really perhaps way out there, Amy, but I'll, I'll just say it. I, I mean, um, quantum computing. Um, yeah. Oh, I, gr I agree 100%. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea, you know, right now, um, uh, the, the very fastest um, you know, IBM computer that exists, um, you know, would take 20 thousand years to to resolve a dispute that a quantum computer can protect, potentially resolve in two seconds. So yep. I, I mean there again, I mean we we can't even begin to comprehend um, what the potential is for that. Um, yeah. And we'll see where that goes. So well and it's funny too when yeah Oh, I love it. No, this is great because the other piece, you know, sometimes they say, well, smart contracts, right? We're supposed to get rid of disputes. We're going to code for it or quantum computing. It'll take over and we don't, we won't even have disputes, but I actually think technology will create more disputes. We're going to have more and different disputes. And I think it creates sort of new avenues for arbitrators to think about their expertise and where they might be able to fit in. I think you're right. And I think that the opportunities for arbitrators are growing both um, horizontally and also vertically. And by that, I mean, um, when you think about the, the, again, the technology field, you know, we're not necessarily dealing with those billion dollar disputes mm -hmm. every day. You know, what we're looking at are disputes that might be um, five, $10 million, $100 million. I mean, sure, I, I've had a couple of very nice cases that were billion dollar cases, but I think for the most part, um, there, there's just been a broadening of, of opportunities for arbitrators. It's just more work because more and more industries are adopting technologies, going global, and that just increases the potential yeah. for, for alternative dispute resolution. My big hope is that they will also for new people, you know, to have diverse and new voices and younger people, because I think that has been a challenge um, for many of us, you know, I, I think it's hard to break in to the arbitration industry and hopefully with technology and things that maybe aren't as accessible for other individuals, I, I do hope that that opens more doors. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I mean, there's certainly been progress and there needs to be a whole lot more in terms of providing for diversity and inclusion. Um, 
there's no doubt. I mean, the movement that we have now regarding transparency is going to help. And just the fact that, you know, arbitrations can now be done around the world on Zoom. Um, you know, something that a lot of people haven't thought about two or three years ago. Um, I think that is going to help. But of course, it's up to everyone individually, um, you know, to make that effort. Be you um, uh, an arbitrator on a case, be you a uh, corporate counsel, be you a you know a law firm counsel, um, an institution. You know, everyone needs to to move forward to help in terms of improving opportunities for people. Yep. Yeah. Hundred percent. I definitely agree. Well, listen, Gary. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking time. And this has been a great conversation. And I know I've learned a lot. And I'm sure everyone who will listen in will hopefully learn a lot too. So thank you, Gary. I appreciate it. Thank you, it. Amy. It's been so much fun. Take care.